to is in John chapter 6, beginning in verse 1 to verse 3 of John chapter 6. It's a, it's a story that is very well known. In fact, it's a f famous story from the Bible. And in John 6, John chapter 6, verse 1 to 13, I'll read it, and you could follow along in your Bible, or maybe they have it in the back here on the screen. It's a long scripture. And here we have the account. It says, sometime after this, Jesus crossed to the far shores of the Sea of Galilee, that is the Sea of Tiberias. <clears throat> and a great crowd of people followed him because they saw the signs that he had performed by healing the sick. Then Jesus went up on the mountainside, sat down with his disciples. The Jewish Passover festival was near. When Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming towards him, he said to Philip, where shall we buy bread that these people may eat? He asked this only to test him, for he already had in mind what he was going to do. And then Philip answered, it would take more than half a year wages to buy enough bread for each one of them to have a bite. Another of his disciples, Andrew, Simon, Peter, brothers, brother spoke up. Here is a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish. But how far will they go among so many? And Jesus said, have the people sit down. And there was plenty of grass in the place. And they sat down. About 5,000 men were there. Jesus then took the loaves and gave thanks, distributed to those that were seated as much as they wanted. He did the same with the fish. When they had all had enough to eat, he said to his disciples, gather the pieces that remain over. Let nothing be wasted. So they gathered, that, gathered at them and filled 12 baskets with the pieces of the five loaves left over by those who had eaten. Lord Jesus, I pray right now that as I speak, that the words may find lodging within the hearts of your people. I pray your Holy Spirit move this morning, continue to move in this service. And we give you all the praise and all the glory. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Now, this miracle that's recorded in this portion of Scripture is one of the most famous miracles in the Bible. In fact, the feeding of the 5,000 is the only miracle that's recorded in the four Gospels. It's recorded in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Now, the Bible says here that there was 5,000 men, not counting the women and the children. So when you think about the crowd that was there, I would say it would be a crowd like the ones we have in our international conferences, a crowd of possibly 20,000 people, 15 to 20,000 people. That's the crowd that he had. So you can see how many people Jesus was ministering to. And the Gospel of Mark tells us that they were in a remote place, and as Jesus was ministering to them, it got late on the, in the day, and the crowd got hungry. Now, what was Jesus going to do in a remote place, and you have a hungry crowd? And the first thing that Jesus did was to bring the disciples, and he was discipling them. Notice it says disciple. The first thing that he did is to bring the disciples face to face with a problem that needed nothing short of a miracle. He brought him before the miracle, a need for a miracle. He said to them, if the people are hungry, then go out and give them to eat. Now the Bible tells us in verse 6, it says that he asked this, notice what it says, he asked this only to test them, for he already had in mind what he was going to do. You see, every time that the Lord challenges us, he always has a plan. He knows exactly what he's going to do. But over here it says that he was testing them and actually testing their faith. Now the disciples had a problem. There was a large crowd, and it was a remote place there in the desert, and there was nothing to eat. Imagine 15 uh, to 20,000 people in the middle of the desert and nothing to eat. Boy, they really had a challenge. And when you think about our ministry, it's very similar. 
you know, God raised up our ministry, and when we look at it, there's uh, about 50 to 20,000 people or even 200 million people, actually 200 million people that are drug addicts. And then Jesus says, go out and reach them. Go out and reach them. Go out and minister to them. Now, over here, when you think about the situation that they were in, what were they to do? The first of all, the first thing we need to know is that every miracle, every, if you want a miracle, every miracle begins with a problem. If you don't have a problem, then you don't really need a miracle. The only way you get a miracle is when you have a problem. It may be a physical problem, spiritual problem, or financial problem. Some of you have problems today that are here this morning. But it must be a legitimate problem for God to work a miracle. Do you have a problem this morning? I'm sure that if I ask people to raise their hands, there will be a lot of people that say, yes, yes, I have a problem. Well, if you have a problem, then I got good news for you. You are a perfect candidate for a miracle this morning. Now, the second thing that Jesus did, Jesus wanted the disciples to accept the responsibility of meeting that need. Now, Jesus himself could have worked it. He could have worked the miracle and could have easily, the miracle, he would have been done. But Jesus says, no, I'm going to put the responsibility on these disciples. You see, God will often ask us to do something that is impossible. That's the way he works. We were speaking about it uh, yesterday morning. We were speaking about how God wants to take us to another level. I believe he's taking us to another level as Victory Outreach as a whole. But I also believe very strongly just being here in San Diego that he wants to take San Diego Victory Outreach to another level. And he will always ask us to do something that is impossible. Because it requires faith. I always say faith. 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 This, is, this is the life that we're supposed to live, a life of faith, a dependency on God. And God is always looking to stretch our faith. And I want you to know, Victory Outreach San Diego, that you are in a faith-stretching season. A faith stretching season. Now, I mentioned yesterday morning that I get disturbed. I get disturbed being here. Oh, you know why I get disturbed being here? That wall bothers me. <laughs> I mean, you know, I look and the wall is so close. And I'm thinking, you know, when I, when I think about the way the Lord is bringing us to another level, there's a whole group of people that God wants to bring into this church. A whole group of people. Just being here this morning, you could see that it's just about full. And this church is a base. I don't know if you know that, but this church is a base. It's not only a local church, but this church is a base. This church is a church that is ministering to many people. You're overseeing regions, and not only that, but even Pastor Al is one of the elders of Victory Outreach. So you have a, a great responsibility to be able to take the responsibility of not only looking at this church, but also the other church that are going to be coming in, and the people that God wants to bring into this church. Now, I've been thinking about it, and, uh, you know, I, Pastor, I'm the pastor. Ben is here, construction Ben. And Ben knows already how, you know, I was in uh, Whittier. I mentioned it yesterday morning in Whittier. I would go into the church, and I said, this church looks like a little box. And some of these pastors are so proud of their church, you know. Uh, Pastor Joe, whenever you say, how's it going? Oh, my 
God, how's it going? <laughs> and he starts giving you a whole speech and a testimony of how God is moving within his church. And then he's sitting in the front row, imagine. He loves his church. And I said, you know, when I come into the building from the outside, it looks so beautiful. Because they got a beautiful building, something similar to the beautiful building right there in, in Whittier, the middle of Whittier, right downtown Whittier. And I say, but when you walk into this auditorium, I said, this auditorium, I, I feel claustrophobia. <laughs> I feel like I'm in a little box. And I said, and then there was a sister. She was here, I think. She came here. She, she was here. Pauline? Sister Pauline. Sister Pauline, how much time did she do in prison? 37? 27 years in prison. And ever since that sister came out of prison, she's been excited about Jesus. <laughs> and you can't hold her back. I think she may have done it over here. She tried to do it, but I don't know what happened. You couldn't go around. But <laughs> she loves to, when she comes to church, she sits in the front row, one of the rows, and as soon as the Holy Spirit starts moving, she gets up. And when she gets up, she get, you know something's going to happen. She gets up. She may point to a few people, you know. <laughs> Hallelujah, you know. And then she goes, and she starts running around the church. Running around, she does that in uh, over there at the at the mother church. Mother church is big, and she just ooh, goes around and <laughs> runs back, and then she looks at people. Ooh, ooh. And some visitors say, "This woman's crazy. <laughs> she's really not crazy. What it is is she's so excited about what God has done within her life." And I noticed she got up over here, and then she looked, and she says, ah, I better not, you know. <laughs> I was telling Whittier, I says, if she tries to run around, she's going to hit that wall. <laughs> but guess what happened? When I said that to Whittier, the very next day, that night they had a meeting, leadership meeting, and the very next day, they had a sledgehammer. <laughs> and they went ahead and they started knocking down that wall. Now when you walk into the church in Whittier, you look, whoa, there's space, there's room. And God is filling it up. God is filling it up. When I uh, was pastoring there in, uh, where was it, in, a, in La Puente, I was going to say La Puente, pastoring the church, the mother church in La Puente. I knew that God wanted to bring growth. I knew it. There was a move of God. Just like there's a move of God that's here this morning, there was a move of God there in La Puente. God was moving by his spirit, and God was bringing in people, and I knew we didn't have the capacity to be able to, uh, to, you know, to, be able to take care of those people. And I said, we need something else. So what we did is we got a big tent. And then not only were we ministering to the people locally and having our people, but we would also have the conferences. And we got a big, big tent that we got. I don't even know if we got approval from City Hall. I don't even know. <laughs> In those days, we just, we just did it. <laughs> got a big tent. And that's where we would have our conference. Some of you oldies remember that. It was like camp meeting when we had our conferences. And people would come from all over the world and be there in our tent. And we would have our conferences there. And then from the tent, we said we need a big building. And we were able to construct a building. We were moving ahead, taking steps of faith, going to the next level. And we constructed a building that would be able to see. It we was able to see about 4,000 people the building that we constructed. And then we would have, again, some of you remember that instead of the tent, you would go to La Puente, and there we would have our conferences. We would have over 3,035, 
I, I think we even squeezed them into 5,000 people. We found a way to squeeze them in. So 5,000 people within our conferences. Now, that's what we would have that. Now, when you think about the World Conference, it would be impossible to have something like that. We would have to, like, we go to the L.A. Convention Center, and there we would have 20,000, 25,000 people that would come to our conferences. We've grown. We grew. God taking us to the next level. Then also, what we're doing now, see, we're always moving ahead. When God wants to grow us, we've got to step out by faith and take the initiative and move ahead. And just lately, we've been, we've been seeing that we have a challenge in our small conferences, like the Mighty Men of Valor, the Women's Convention, you know, those small conferences. We've been using some of the, the conference there in, in Ontario. But I said, wouldn't it be great if we have a need, wouldn't it be great for us to have our own conference center? Yeah. Now, to be honest with you, I don't have the faith yet to have a conference center that will seat over 20,000 people, 30,000 people. I, I'm not there yet. <laughs> Who knows, soon I'll get there, but I'm not, I'm not there yet. But I do believe that we do have the faith to look for a place that we could have a conference center that will seat six or 7,000 people. Six or 7,000 people. And uh, what would that do? Well, we would bring in the Mighty Men of Valor there, the Women's Convention, the Youth Convention, all these conventions that we have, we would bring them into the Victory Outreach Conference Center. And who knows, maybe somebody, one of the pastors, would have faith enough to open up a church at the conference center that will be able to fill it up. Who knows? God is raising up a whole lot of people. So, you know, stepping out, stepping out, moving ahead, always stepping out. Believing God that he's taking us to the next level. And this is, I believe, the challenge that he's given. He's given right now, and I can feel it. He's given to Victory Outreach San Diego. Now, I look at these walls. And I've been here before. I've been pastoring. I was pastoring here before. I think when we had that, I think we still had this auditorium like this, right? We knocked down a little wall. Not a big wall. <laughs> but a little wall. Now, I think that, that possibly, again, did we get the politicians to cooperate with us? <laughs> uh, he's, he's victory outreach already, man. I believe that we could probably, again, this is faith, you know, this is, what are we talking about? Miracles, right? You know, if, if you have a problem, if you have a challenge, then you need nothing short of a miracle. Huh? Back here. Oh. You guys have been working on it already, my God. Well, is it, uh, could it accommodate about, what is it, about 1,400 people? Huh? Huh? You don't know. I think it would be good to have a, a building that would accommodate 1,400 people. You know what? I like to knock down walls. <laughs> I think if you knock down a number of these walls, I think you could probably get a capacity of 1,400 people. 
Now you would pray that the city hall would, like, you got connections. <laughs> I'm putting him on the spot here this, this morning. Could you imagine having capacity for 1,400 people? I think uh, I have Ben here. Ben looks right away, and he could figure it out. Ben believes in miracles. Imagine you have 1,400 people. Say you, the number one is that you'll be able to accommodate the other regions. Because pretty soon, as far as the regions are concerned, you're not going to be able to fill them. Even the mother church, when they have these uh, regions coming in, he, they can't accommodate. I think mother church was thinking small. When I turned it over to them, and then they went ahead and they sold the building, and they looked ahead. What kind of building they had? I think they were thinking just about their church. If it would have been me, I would have been thinking about a place that will accommodate five, 6,000 people. So now there's a problem. Now there's a problem. They can't even accommodate the regions. And this could happen here as well. This could happen. But I believe there are people of faith here this morning. And again, I say... When you have a problem, then you are a perfect candidate for a miracle. So where's a sledgehammer right now? <laughs> Let's knock down some walls. Now, I know that, and I'm getting, just talking to you guys. I mentioned I'm just talking to you guys. I know that parking is a problem. That's a problem. Whenever you're going to expand then they're going to say, well, how much parking do you have? And I don't think you have the parking right now to be able to accommodate that. But there's parking all around. You could, you could have them park two blocks away. And then what do you do? Well, are they going to walk? You know, well, they, you know, people don't like to walk, right? <laughs> so what do you have to solve the problem? You have a shuttle. Look how simple it is. You have a shuttle. You have our vans that could go ahead. And as the people go into those parking places, you have the van there. You have a shuttle that will bring them here to the church. After the service is over, you'll have a shuttle that will take them back to their parking places. And I think there's parking, there's parking, there's parking. If you go two blocks away, there's places that you could find parking. You could work out a deal. You could rent it, and they'll be able to, you'll be able to get the parking. So, <laughs> what's all on your back, brother? <laughs> you think you could do it? Yeah. You think you could do it? God is bringing this ministry to the next level. He's shuttling them in, shuttling those buses coming in and bringing the people from those parking places. Now imagine if you have 1,400 people. Imagine if you have double services. You'll be building, you'll be building growing to what? What's 14 and 14? I, I can't, I'm not, how much? How much? 28. 2,800 people. Do you have faith for 2,800 people? Well, if we could do it, we went by faith, putting that tent, and then we built a building. We had over 3,500 people in our church. And that was years ago. And if we could do it, you could do it as well. So, I'll leave you with that problem. <laughs> I'm leaving tomorrow to Panama. <laughs> I, I, I go to churches and I shake them up, man. And after I shake them up, I say, goodbye, I'll see you. I'll see you, I'll see you later. You know? I think this is going to stay. People, it stays with you, man. Right away, some guys are going to say, give me the sledgehammer. I want to 
I want to knock it down. But we're talking here about miracles. This is what Jesus was doing. He was trying to get them and give them the responsibility, an impossible responsibility of meeting that need. You see, the bigger the ministry, the more faith is needed. The bigger the ministry. I, I'm believing that God is raising up mega churches in Victory Outreach. Mega churches. I'm looking already at the mega churches that he's raising up. This is one of the mega churches that he's raising up. Now, you guys didn't come first and run for hope. You know who came first and run for hope? Tell me who. Who? I can't hear it. <laughs> Julie and I have been working in San Jose, ministering in San Jose, and San Jose is a small church. You know how many people they had when we got, you know, they went through a lot of struggles and a lot of different problems. When we went in, how many people did they have when we went in? About not even 300 people. And then in a period we've been there, we've been bringing it up, and I think we brought it up to about 400 people, something like that. There were about 400 people. Could you imagine? Look at the people you have. Shame on you. <laughs> Not only you, but could you imagine the mother church? The mother church. If you're watching me, mother church, I know you're going <laughs> to. The mother church has about 1,500 people. And we beat the mother church and run for hope two years in a row. Our little group there in San Jose, little group in San Jose went ahead and, and did the impossible two years in a row and beat the mother church in run for hope. And I think, uh, did you come in second or third? Third? Who came in second? Oh, yeah, that's right. We came in first. <laughs> I'm drilling it in, man. We came in first. The mother church came in second. And somebody came in third. That San Diego came in third. And I think Whittier came in fourth. So when you look at it, it's the mother church, well, it's San Jose, you know, first, I mean, two years in a row, you know, being with 400 people, they, they did the impossible. 1,500 people, the mother church, 400 people, San Jose, and twice in a row, they whipped them. <laughs> and they whipped you guys, too. And the mother church is saying, no, 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 this time we're going to win. This time nobody's going to beat us. We're going to win. Well, we'll see what happens. We'll see what if, 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 if they don't win, if they don't take first place, then, oh, my God, it's going to be embarrassing. It's going to be embarrassing for them. It's going to be embarrassing for a church called San Diego. And it's going to be embarrassing for the Whittier church. But you notice that those are the churches the, that stand out. Mother church, well, San Jose with a little group. We still stand out over there, you know, with the little group. We're saying, wait, we got to notice. Look at us. Hallelujah. We're little, but look at us. We're little, but we have a lot of faith. So San Jose stands out, the Mother Church stands out, San Diego stands out, Whittier stands out, and these are the churches you could see that God is establishing bases, bases. So even the church in uh, San Jose, I think we accommodate more than you guys. Legally, the church in San Jose is able to sit, I think, 14 Hundred people in San Jose, and I'm saying, well, once you fill it up, we'll find we'll find another way to be able to expand it. Fourteen hundred people, and we don't have fourteen hundred people; we have four hundred people. But we have a whole four hundred people that are believing for growth, that are believing God, 
for miracles. That's where it's at. Believing the Lord for miracles. And this is what he was trying to do with the disciples. See, the bigger the ministry, the more faith is needed. This miracle that they needed required faith. The Bible says, without faith it is impossible to please God. Now, Philip, one of his disciples, reacted to this situation like many of us will possibly react. Philip said in chapter 6 and verse 7, Philip answered him, eight months' wages would not buy enough bread for each one to have a bite. Now, what happened with Philip? In other words, Philip had that mentality, we can't do it. Mind you, Jesus was telling them, gave them the responsibility, and he says we can't do it. Philip and the disciples were saying, send them home. It's not our problem. If they're hungry, let them find their own food. We can't afford to feed them. Doesn't that sound like many of us sometimes? Many people miss God's plan because they can't see themselves as dynamic Christians or dynamic leaders. You hear that? They say, I could never be this or be that. Today, I want you to catch the vision of the great men and women of God that he wants you to be. Don't you ever underestimate your potential. You can be more than you are right now. That's what the story of Victory Orange is about. A little Dolphy church that God raised up in East L.A. that has become a worldwide movement. How did he do this? By God's people believing and stepping out in faith. See, God can take you're not enough, you're not enough, and make it more than enough. And then God delights in choosing, I said it all, God delights in choosing people like you and I. You know why? Because he gets all the glory. Especially when we're getting professionals now. In the beginning, we didn't have any professionals. Now we got doctors that are part of Victory Outreach. We have others that have gone through university, others that are writing books. There's books that are written now. They send me the, to the forward of people that have graduated from the university. They say, I got saved in the home. Yeah. I got saved. The other day, there's a brother that's been so blessed that he dropped in our office and he said to the secretary, listen, I came in through the home and God has blessed me so much that I would like to make a, I would like to go ahead and make an investment within the ministry and I have something for Pastor Sonny. I have a love offering. And he left the love offering. And then they said, Pastor, you have a love offering here that somebody gave you. I went to the office when I was going at the office. He says, here's the love offering. I opened up the love offering, $10,000. Could you imagine? $10,000. You know that this guy is doing good when he's able to give $10,000. You see, God has raised us up now, and there's people from all over the world. But how did it start? It didn't start like that. It started out with a group of crazy drug addicts. And I think the craziest drug addicts that we had in Victory Outreach were right here in San Diego. I mean, you had crazy drug addicts here. Every one of them... Some of them wouldn't even work, but they had a passport in their pocket. <laughs> We're ready to go somewhere. Hallelujah. I came in here. I said, whoa, my God. But that's the beginning of our ministry. The beginning of our ministry, they would uh, go ahead and, and be able to classify which was the most effective churches. And the most effective churches, they had pride, and we're the craziest. We're the craziest people. We're the hardcore dolphins. <laughs> and some of you were like that. You remember? Some of you. And they would say, well, we got more dolphins than San Bernardino. And then when we look at uh, L.A., oh, those people are too conservative. 
Those people, were never, they weren't really dolphins, man. They don't even have big tracks on their arms. That was the mentality that we had years ago. But even with that mentality, and even where we were at that level that we were in, God says, I'm going to raise me up a people. I'm going to raise me up a people that want to know people. And the reason why is because God delights in choosing people like you and me. Even the most ordinary people have extraordinary potential when God is, is in it because God gets all the glory. And the disciples here were trying to dodge their responsibility. You see, God has raised up this ministry victory hour to meet a need of the hurting people in their cities, not locally, but in the cities of the world. You've heard that over and over. God has given us an impossible task, even in spite of our limited resources. God has given us a big vision and a God-sized vision. Now, there are many people that settle for a mediocre vision, a limited vision, and some of the reasons are because they don't want to pay the price. That happens. You're not willing to pay the price. They're not willing to pay the price in their commitment, and they're not willing to pay the price in their sacrifice. See, God has called us to be committed people and a people of sacrifice. See, we are a frontier cutting edge ministry. That's what God has called us to do. This is why I say that he hasn't called us to be a, a church where you sit down and you're just feeding the people and everybody's being fed and praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Glory to God. And then you go home. That's not, that, that's not what God has called. Now, other churches do it, and that's fine. That's their ministry. That's, that's what they're supposed to do. With us, Victory Outreach has a mission. A mission. And our mission is to reach the inner cities of the world. So we are a unique ministry. And in the beginning, many people kind of mocked it and said, why are we speaking about vision? Why are we speaking about vision, 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 vision? Well, it's because God has given us a vision. God has given us a mandate. God has given us a mission. And we've tried to be faithful to that mission. And look where we are today. Because of the power of God, because of his miracle working power all over the world. You know, I'm pastor of thousands of pastors. Some that are in victory outreach and others that are not in victory outreach, but they look at me as their pastor. Even though I never see them. <laughs> but whenever I see them, they say, you are our pastor. You are our pastor. Because of the influence that this ministry has had within their lives. Do you see what God is doing? I want you to understand what God is doing. See, the Bible is filled with example of people that gave their not enough and God made it more than enough. We have uh, people saw Moses as a Hebrew fugitive. God saw Moses as a leader who would liberate his people. People saw David as a young shepherd boy. God saw David as a great king. People saw Paul as a Christian persecutor. God saw Paul as a great missionary apostle that would preach the gospel to the Gentile. People saw the Samaritan woman as an outcast of sight. Jesus saw her as a missionary. Some saw victory outreach as a drug addict church. God saw victory outreach as a worldwide movement. You see, this morning, God is not looking for ability. He's not looking for ability. He's looking for availability. And when Julie and I, at that particular time, you say, well, God is, why didn't God raise up somebody else? There was a lot of people that more, were more qualified than us. There's always people like that that are more qualified. But yet, they weren't ready. But Julie and I says, yes, we will go. We will go. We will go. We were available. Now, the process of God taking our not enough and making it more than enough is not without its challenges. The first challenge that you face is the fear to step out on God's word. When God wants to work a miracle in your life or when he calls you to do something, he wants you to step out. Step out on his word. When we started the ministry, we we didn't see everything that was supposed to happen. 
Let's just show you all that. Just like many of you that are getting all those Bible studies, okay? You're getting all those Bible What are you going to do? The time is going to come. He says, okay, step out. Yeah. Right? Step out. I've seen many in Victory Outreach. I mean, they have all kinds of degrees. But they never step out. Because they're afraid to step out on God's word. See, fear is the opposite of faith. And when we stepped out... We didn't see everything now. Now we see, you know, many hundreds of, of, of ministries that have been established, and we see we're all over the world. We didn't see that. All we had to do was be obedient. He doesn't reveal everything. We were a, a Dauphine church, and I was the junkie pastor. That's what they call me, the drug addict pastor. If he, Actually, an article came out, right? The junkie priest, an article came out. Junkie church <laughs> and a junkie priest. And I said, yeah, okay, at that time, that's fine. That's who I am. The junkie pastor with a junkie congregation. <laughs> and I didn't know where God was going to take us. All I knew, my vision was that God said, reach, reach East L.A. And some of those neighborhoods said, yes, Lord, we're available and we'll do it. Little did we see what God was going to do. But we were willing to step out. And I have learned still to step out. This, uh, I step out into places. I say, oh, my God, what did I do? <laughs> Remember that? conference that we had I got inspired you know I get inspired and I thought Man, hallelujah we could do anything for God and then I came up and I said okay we're going to have a, a thousand two, well, a thousand by the year 2000 a thousand churches hallelujah by the year 2000 well did we get there I say, no, no way far from the thousand. She said, but I, anyway, I stepped out. I got excited. We, we, we're going to step out and fail many times. I, I, I failed many times, you know, stepping out. And sometimes you get excited and you step out and it doesn't happen. And sometimes when I step out, I say, oh, God, is this going to be the same experience again? <laughs> I've stepped out on a lot of. A lot of projects right now. I never was involved in the Spanish ministry. And I stepped out. And sometimes I get second thoughts. What in the world am I doing here? <laughs> I stepped out to Panama. You know that, right, Panama? And we're building up the work in Panama. Then at the same time, I even took an another step. And I stepped out to Mexico to reach some of those pastors. And I picked seven of them. In Mexico, they called them the Magnificent Seven. <laughs> In Mexico, the other pastors, oh, well, they are special, huh? But I was looking for pastors. I said, I'm going to work. I'm not going to work with deadhead pastors. If I'm going to work with pastors, I want pastors that, that have a vision and pastors that are movers. So I recognized a number of them. I pulled them, and now they're part of me working with them as I work with uh, Panama. In fact, Monday, to tomorrow, I'll be heading out to Panama, and the pastors from Mexico will be coming in. We'll be having like a pastor summit. The pastor from, from Cuba, Abel, will be coming in, and we have different pastors that are going to be coming in, and we're believing God that there's going to be a move of God within our Spanish-speaking ministry. And when I get into it, you know, I can't preach in Spanish. I can say, bueno, que Dios, la presencia de Dios está aquí, hallelujah. But to get to preach something like this, I'll make a mess. And I told you yesterday, some of you, what I did, right? You know, estoy excitado. <laughs> some of you that were not here, you know, what, what, what do you do? You, when you, you get excited, right? You say it all the time. 
I'm so excited. Okay? That's what I know. I'm so excited. Ooh, I'm so excited. Well, that's a, a sex thing in the Spanish. And then I said to them like that, you know, yo estoy tan excitado. And then the sister says, oh, no, pastor, no. <laughs> Emocionado. And I said, what's the difference? He said, well, you say excitado, sex, you know. You're getting excited about sex. I mean, experience like that, you know, just jumping in by faith, you're going to have some weird experiences. <laughs> I had another experience that I had with the, the mayor, the mayor there in, in the city that we have the home in, and he, he, he got close to the home, and he was excited what's happening. And uh, this mayor, uh, they said, you got to meet the mayor. So the mayor's a real sophisticated guy, real respected in the community. And you know me. I'm just me. <laughs> so the mayor came, he wanted to meet me. So when I'm sitting with him, I don't know if I told you before, but when I'm sitting with him, he starts giving me uh, his resume. He starts giving me, I was a heroin addict. And God changed my life. And I used to do this, and I used to do that. And look what the Lord did for me. So I'm there, and then in Spanish, I respond, Ah, pues tú eras un malito. So he thought I said malita. And he goes, oh, no. Oh, no, 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 no. Another mistake that I did. I have made a mistake even in the early days when uh, Nicky Cruz, you know, that uh, he, he having the big crusades and I'm interpreting for him. Right? Remember that? And Nicky's the type that gets emotional, you know, Nicky. And he's coming back, coming to his, the end of his, of his testimony. And he goes, Nicky's an emotional guy. You, you know, that's, God uses him tremendously. You may not even understand what he said. <laughs> but at the end of the service, people are coming, crying, and weeping before the altar. And Nicky goes, Dios. You know, most of my guys. So I said, and God. <laughs> that was before Nikki couldn't speak English. I don't know if he's still. <laughs> don't get mad at me, Nikki. Dios. And God. Tomó ese corazón. And he was coming to the. And God took that heart. I was just recently saved. I'm over here interpreting. Y tomó ese corazón de carne. I hadn't been in Bible school or anything like that, you know. And God took that heart of meat. And Nikki turns at me <laughs> and said, not meat, flesh. <laughs> that was the last time I interpreted for him. <laughs> he fired me. <laughs> I messed up the whole crusade <laughs> that he had. But the key is to step out. I've seen many that, you know, they, they're ready, they've gone to school, they got their, their you know, their, well, their degrees, and you see them sitting. You say, what happened? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm waiting for God. <laughs> I'm waiting for God. How long are you going to wait for God? You need to be able to, to, be able to step up. If you want God to use your life, then there's a period, there's a time where you have to be able to step out. And there's always a fear within the heart of somebody to be able to step out on God's word. You see, fear is the opposite of faith, and faith is the opposite of fear. 
But then also the second challenge, when we think about the challenge, is also we respond with doubt. Doubt. That's what these guys were doing. Doubt. God didn't say you wouldn't have problems. Just because he called you doesn't mean you don't have problems. In fact, you'll have big problems. Because unfavorable circumstances have a way of creating doubt within your mind. And then number three, the third challenge to overcome is inferiority complex. We feel inferior. Many of us have, to, have had to overcome this problem. Now, I see that within Victory Outreach. You know, we've been, we've been stomped on and they said, well, you can't ever do nothing. Even my mom. My mom, when Julie spoke to her and says, she said to my mom, my mom said to her, you know, Judy, that's my sister, Judy was great. She was smart. She was an A student. But Sonny, he was average. Average. And very easily, I mean, you could develop an inferiority complex. You have people looking at you like that. And that happens a lot in Victory Outreach. And when you think about it, we have examples of people that God has used. You know that Sonny Jr., look at the way he preaches. And he preaches better than me. I mean, he, he could this guy could preach. And do you know that at one time he wouldn't, he wouldn't even talk? He would just be there like that. I said, what's wrong with you? <laughs> what in the world is wrong with you? These people were talking to you. What are you going like that for? <laughs> and then I wanted him to take flying lessons. And he was taking the lessons. And, he, you know, he quit. And the reason why he quit, because he didn't want to talk to the tower. <laughs> now, if you're a pilot, you better talk to the tower, man. <laughs> Do I got to do that? He tells the guy that's training, do I got to talk? He says, yes, you got to talk to the, to the tower. You got to talk to the, Go ahead and talk to the No, 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 I don't, I don't want to talk to the tower. And then he quit. You would never think that he would be the preacher that he is today. <laughs> See, God has taken the foolish things of the world. And many of us have to overcome that problem. He overcame the problem. And then what about his son, Cruz? Cruz is another one. Cruz is another one that was kind of, um, you know, isolated and into his thing. And all he did was music all the time. And music, he tried to talk to him. He was playing either the bass or he was playing the piano. Everything was music. You couldn't talk to him. You know, you couldn't talk to him. And one day we were laying in bed, Julie and I, and we were looking at the uh, online. You know how you look online? And then we said, okay, what's happening? You know, online. And then we came across somebody that was preaching. And it looked like Cruz. And, it was, and the way he was preaching, you know, I'm going to tell you. And, and this. And, you know, my, my God could do it. And God is able. God is a do the. And I said, man, it looks like Cruz. He was preaching to the young. I says, it can't be Cruz. There's no way that's Cruz. I mean, even Cruz don't like to talk. <laughs> What's the matter? Sonny's family, you don't, like, you don't like to talk. <laughs> and then uh, I said to Julie, Julie, you can see Cruz is preaching. Look. And she's in bed and she says, nah, that can't be Cruz. That's not, that's not Cruz. And then I looked a little bit closer, and I said, that is Cruz. I said, look. <laughs> That's Cruz. And she looked, she says, oh, my God, it's Cruz. <laughs> and you know what Cruz does now? He's preaching. He's preaching. And you should see him preach. Not only is he preaching, he's laying hands on people. He goes and lays hands on people. He's even slaying people in the name of the Lord. There was a whole turnaround that took place, and I'm believing God is raising him up. 
He had a complex, but he was able to overcome that complex. So then also there's uh, what we look at is uh, many times we feel inferior when it comes to the supernatural resources needed for a miracle. See, don't let these challenges keep you from your miracle. I know I'm speaking to people here this morning, and you're backing off, and you, you're afraid to step out. Don't let those challenges keep you from your miracle. We all feel ordinary, all of us. We all are afraid at times. We all have times of doubt. But let's remember that God is a faithful God, and God is is a miracle working God. And then also number three, we need to give to God what we got. Everything we got, we need to give to God, even though it's not much, because that demonstrates faith. Now in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, and verse 8, it says, and God will generously provide all you need, then you will always have everything you need, and plenty left over. Now the hero of this story is this little boy with the five loaves and two fishes. There are two things that we could say about this boy. First, he gave all he had. Everything he had, he just turned it off. He gave what he had. It was five loaves and two fishes, and he didn't hold anything back. If you want a miracle this morning from God, you cannot hold anything got back from God. What are you holding back this morning? Are you saying, I'll give you everything except this in my life? Never underestimate God, what God could do through ordinary people who give their limited resources over to God. The Bible says he's chosen the foolish things of the world. That's one of our famous scriptures. Then secondly, he gave it immediately immediately when it was asked for. He didn't hesitate. He didn't doubt. He gave it as soon as it was asked for. Jesus needed it, and he went ahead and gave it. I'm sure there were others there that had their little lunch, but they weren't willing to give it. He probably even had to convince Andrew to take it to Jesus. He probably went to Andrew and says, here's my little lunch. And Andrew says, what in the world am I going to do with that? And he says, here, take it to Jesus. I know Jesus is going to do something. I just know Take the little that I have and just put it in the hands of Jesus. He probably had to go after Andrew. Please, 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 just give it to Jesus. Faith was swelling up in this little boy. Give it to Jesus. Now, why don't we give like that when we need a miracle? Well, there are reasons we worry that we may end up going hungry. Yes, if, you, if I give my lunch to Jesus, what do I have to eat? If I give my money to Jesus, then what am I going to live on? If I give and commit my life to Jesus, will he be able to take care of me? Secondly, we think, how can the little that I have help the situation? In this story, there were 15,000 people, a little boy with five loaves and two fishes. The natural thing was say, how could that help? That was Andrew's reaction in chapter 6 and verse 9. He says, how far... With this go among so many. Andrew was saying that. How can the little that I have help so many? But this little boy says, if I give my little lunch to Jesus, he is going to work a miracle. 2 Corinthians chapter 8 verse 12 says, The important thing is to be willing to give as much as you can. That is why God accepts and no one asks you to give what you do not have. Because the little boy gave and gave what he had. God was able to perform the miracle. I think I see many of you that have given what you have and look what God has done in your life and look at the way God has been able to use it. John 6, 10 says, Jesus fed the whole multitude with the five loaves and two fishes. How did it happen? How did it happen? How did it happen? How did it happen? A miracle. It was a miracle that actually took place. It just kept on multiplying before their very own eyes. Like Julie and I with the pancake. I'm not going to go into some of you old. How many of you haven't heard that about the pancake? Raise your hand if you haven't heard about the pancake. Raise it high. Raise it high. How many have heard about the pancake? 
that I'm not going to say it. <laughs> Get it from the other. We, we've seen that happen. The early days of history of Victory Outreach, that's one of the most famous stories in Victory Outreach. Julie giving pancakes to these drug addicts and God multiplying it just before. But I, I, I want to read the book. <laughs> like the widow in the Bible who gave to Elijah all that she had. She never went hungry again. What do you need today? Whatever you need today, then expect a miracle. God specializes in things that are humanly impossible. The word impossible, I have you know, is not in God's vocabulary. Impossible is not in God's vocabulary. It's with us, but it's not in God's vocabulary. And many of us today have experienced what God can do when we give him or not enough. By giving him an art enough to unite it, we can. We've been able to reach the masses of people in countries like El Salvador, Mexico, Australia, New Zealand, Holland, South Africa, Philippines, Indonesia, and now in Panama, and many other, well, the other places around the world. Jeremiah says, nothing is too hard for God. He says, all things are possible for those who believe. And then also Matthew 9, 29, according to your faith, it will be done unto you. The story teaches us the principle that you cannot outgive God. John 6, 13 says, So they gathered the pieces left over, and they filled 12 baskets with the pieces of the five barley loaves left over from those that had eaten. The Bible tells us 12 baskets were left over. Who do you think went home with those 12 baskets? The little boy that gave the five loaves and the two fishes, and he believed God for a miracle, instead of going empty-handed, he went back with a basket. Twelve baskets that were left over. So you see, God is able to do the impossible. Anytime you give sacrificially to God, it always end, ends up you getting more because you cannot outgive God. Now, God has called Victor Eric to reach the inner cities of the world, and he's asking us to give are not enough so he can make it more than enough. Today, God wants to use you, even with your limited resources, to reach the nation. Today, he wants to release a miracle within your life. Now, I tell you, if you're going to see God doing some great things and you see miracles, then it's going to take a people of faith, a people that are excited, a people that are believing God for the miracle of what God wants to do here within this church. Are you ready for that? Yes. Are you ready for that? Yes. Are you ready for that? Yes. You people getting quiet on me. <laughs> I get nervous. You think they get nervous. I get Whenever a congregation gets quiet, I get nervous. <laughs> Especially if somebody is looking at me like this pastor looking at me like, He's scaring the daylights out of me. <laughs> he, he says, he, I'm, I'm getting it all on you. Then I see this other guy over there. <laughs> that is scary. But this morning, I think the message has come out loud and clear. You know what the message is? The message is that God has taken you to the next level. So, give me the sledgehammer. We have a sledgehammer. Okay, bring this. The people are getting nervous now. No, no, no. We're not, we're not going to knock down any walls right now. But I believe that God wants you. Pastor Al is going to come in a minute, and I think God wants to prepare you, and want, God wants to do something special this morning within your life. He wants to do something special and bring forth a miracle within your life. He wants to bring forth a miracle when it comes to finances. He wants to work a miracle, in, and there are people that are hurting right now, and you're hurting when it comes to finances. And then there's other people that God has called to the ministry. 
that he wants to take you to the next level, and he's asking you to step out, to step out, step out. Everything we have done, we've stepped. I'm still stepping out, and I'm even looking ahead. Now we're going into the, over there with the Victory Homes International. We're stepping out again, stepping out. And we don't know, we don't, we, we're saying, okay, God didn't say, okay, I guarantee you the success. All we know, there's a need. That's the ministry that God has given us to reach drug addicts. There's an epidemic that has taken place there in the East Coast, in the Midwest. An epidemic that's taken place, and we're not there. One night I couldn't sleep, and just couldn't sleep. That's the way God works with me. And I, I wake up and I, I begin to think about the epidemic that's there and we're not there. The next thing I did was have a meeting with our leadership and said, why are we not there? And they said, well, we don't, we don't know. We don't have people that are able to identify with them. I said, no, somehow let's send a group that's going to spy out the land. We need to be. And you know what's happening as they're out there spying the land? God is moving. They're praying for people. People are, are receiving Jesus Christ. They're praying for deliverance. They got one guy that was after them and wouldn't let them go. They sent him out here. He's the first one that's coming out here of many others that God is going to raise up and send out here for deliverance. And then by faith, by faith, by faith, we are stepping out. We have a whole group that's going to be going. We're going to be launching out groups the 1st of January to go and open up homes there in those three states. Ohio, West Virginia, New Hampshire. We're believing God for a move of God that's going to take place. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm still old school. You say, do I still have a burden? I sure do. I have a whole global ministry. But I still have a burden for these drug addicts that are hurting. And there are many of you that you're not going to make it as pastor. If you're waiting that you're going to get your pastor's credential and you're looking, I'm going to pastor a church, you're not going to pastor nothing. I see some guys come, I'm going to be pastor. I look at it, you're going to be a pastor or nothing. You don't have a calling for a pastor. Some don't have a calling for a pastor. In fact, you get up here and you bore everybody. And <laughs> then after a while, you don't, they don't invite you no more. And why have I been invited? I mean, I gotta, well, you bore everybody. And the reason why you bore everybody is because that's not your calling. But some of you... If we turn you loose in the ministry of the home, then watch out. When we begin to turn you loose in your power spot. So align yourself, man. Align yourself with the calling that God has given to you. And don't be saying, well, I want to be a pastor because I want to have my credentials and I want to sit up there the way the other pastors sit up there. And God has God has gone. I, I see some guys, man, I'm even afraid to preach. I said it yesterday. Every time I'm going to preach, I get nervous. I was sitting there and I'm looking at a, and I'm nervous. And he looks at me, you know, and I'm, I'm nervous. And I'm, I'm the founder. I mean, you, you get nervous when you're with me. I get nervous when I'm with you. <laughs> and yet there's some guys, I don't understand. There's some guys that are, they don't even know how to preach. They speak terrible when they get up there. Even some guys want to pick up offerings. They're the worst offering <laughs> raises you ever see. I know one guy, he goes up and he wants to pick up an offering. We used them a few times and he goes and he tries to give a speech, the most boring speech you ever heard. And then he wants to pick up a, nobody gives, why? Well, yeah, I, I don't blame him. I'm not going to give either when I hear it. But we have an opportunity right now. God has opened up a ministry where you may fit. And that's exciting. 
Even Julie was saying, man, couldn't we go in and be directors of a home? You know, we, we would do it. We would do it. And the reason why we would do it is because we're game to do anything that God wants to do. Even in, even in Panama, we don't even understand Spanish. We don't know how to speak Spanish anymore, but I'm getting, if these guys don't cut it, I'm going to get there. I'm going to get there, and I'm going to be the pastor there. And by the grace of God, we are going to raise a powerful ministry there in Panama. The key is a willingness to do whatever it takes to see God's miracle take place. Those are the type of guys we need. All these guys up here, everybody up here. You look good. But what happens after that? What happens when you have to step out? All those that are the, uh, in the school of ministry with the, uh, what is it? The, what is it? Betty. Betty. All those are Betty. I, I had to tell them, forget about degrees. It's important to get your degree, but even beyond that, it's important for you to step out by faith and let God work a miracle in your life and use you. These people up here, I, I see them and I'm impressed that they, they're faithful and all standing up here and getting all that stuff. Now, if you can't build this church, then something is wrong. With all these leaders, and if you can't take this church to 1,400, then something is terribly wrong. See the way I provoke? That's why they don't want me to preach to the churches no more. I'm provoked. Now the next time I come, I think I will have a 1,400. Pastor, I will have a 1,400. Well, I did my part. Hey, I slap you around a little bit. I've been nice to you this morning. And, uh, well, goodbye. I'm going to Panama. I want to turn it over to your pastor, Pastor Al. Oh, love you, Pastor. How many appreciate our pastor? Love him so much. Come on, put that picture up quick, guys. Come on. Let's give God a big, big praise, everybody. Man, what a morning. What a weekend it has been. I want you to be seated for a moment. I want our ushers to start to hand out all the envelopes. And please, no moving around right now. I know some people had to leave, and they're probably newcomers. But how many know this is family business? And... I think we heard it clear. But just, just give them out, ladies. Don't even ask. Just give them out. We've heard very clearly the vision that the Lord has given us through our founders. And I think many of you know that Georgina and I have uh, really fought through.